Hi, everybody, and welcome to Replenish Earth Speaker Series, where we explore climate action through the lens of innovative and exciting speakers. Today marks the fourth day of London Climate Action Week, where we drive the national and international climate policy response prioritizing green recovery. We'll be exploring four themes, a green, fair, resilient recovery, a roadmap to COP26, sustainable net zero London, and whole society climate mobilization. I'm Tia Kansara, and we're going to be exploring how might we live a more visually inspiring life. Join us as we explore the world of art, climate action, and visual inspiration with Maureen Tongi. Maureen was awarded Forbes 2018-30 Under 30 in Europe, Arts and Culture UK Entrepreneur of the Year for 2019, NatWest Every Woman Awards, her TED Talks are phenomenal, you should definitely go and watch them, um, How to Transform Cities with Art and How Social Media Visuals Affect Our Minds. She's got incredible depth when it comes to art and how art can be managed. She started her first gallery at the age of 21, um, opened her first gallery at the age of 20, um, 25, 23. Uh, she's a writer and expert on contemporary art and investment. Uh, she's an advocate for artists through MT Art, which is the first talent agency for visual artists worldwide. MT Art Agency was behind the largest public art Art painting in the world, the project SAPI in Paris, supported by 30 companies, including the Eiffel Tower and the Guardian Media Group. Um, I'm going to share a little video of some of the work that she has um, has supported through the agency, through David Osavan Schreiber. Sorry if I didn't pronounce it, your name correctly. Um, and I'm going to share a little video right now of uh, the art that I believe can really inspire us towards climate action. Without further ado. Wow, I mean, that is incredibly stunning art. I want to welcome Maureen on Replenish Earth Live. Hi, Maureen. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. And and it's just so nice to start with the art of David. I and mean, as you can see, I'm utterly biased um, with how incredible David is. But I also feel he has been our lucky star for the past six years now. And he is someone that, again, uh, brings the tones down and, and makes sure that you are being reflective, you do add depth to a subject that can be um, such a buzzword now, sadly. And and also he does it with so much um, heart and emotion and care and, and talent as well. Um, so I'm glad we started with him. And I'm obviously um, very, very, very lucky that we are working with him. Absolutely. One of the quotes on um, your website 
that really inspires me is that art no longer seems separated into distinct categories of architecture and artwork, that which is outside and that which is inside. There's this sort of bridge between what art can be indoors and in our intimate lives, in our introspective lives, just as much as it can be in our extroverted, you know, external spaces. So there's this beautiful bridge between where the city can play a part in art and how you feel towards the city environment, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I'm one of the lucky person who can say that I'm living through the dream that I had when I was five. And and I, I've always kind of seen reality uh, visually as all integrated, uh, meaning when you look at um, digitally on your phone, when you step on your streets, um, what you have in your house, anything like this is just, in, it belongs to one visual reality and, and I want that reality to be as inspiring as possible and and I think at five years old I was more thinking in the degree of fairies can I just turn it into something nicer can I just you know throw a bit of magic and then it will happen um but the reason I say this is because it has happened I think you know you mentioned um with the largest public art painting in the world I remember being heavily pregnant on the top of the Eiffel Tower, looking at um, 800 meters of paint just below my feet. And and it is something when you respect the child in you and, and you make it happen later. Um, obviously now I don't use fairy tales or anything. It's just, you know, we made it happen uh, pragmatically. Um, it is very magical. And I, I do absolutely believe that everyone deserves an inspiring visual reality, not just the luxury world. I've always found that strange, in fact, that it's only when you have a lot of money that you can aspire to have something visually aesthetic. And I've never kind of felt that was right. Um, I feel, you know, I would want every street. I mean, of course, like I'm now in the position of privilege. I will make sure my house is really wonderful, but it shouldn't be at that stage when you are privileged that you can start caring. It should be at, you know, when you go to school and when you go on the streets and like my son walks up to nursery, like he should see stuff that's exciting on the way, you know. So it doesn't, it doesn't need to start at the level of wealth. Um, and that was always also in the heart of our belief that our artists, if they were to inspire you, they will inspire you at every stage of your life, whether you had money or whether you didn't. I think that's really beautiful about the circle of life in that you know, from the moment that we're born, we are inspired by something visually, and it's our eyes that open and, our, you know, our voice and our ears and all of our senses that are becoming present to what's happening in our external environment. And one of the ways that we learn how to speak is by observing the way that our mother's mouths are, are moving, the sound that comes out, and the energy that they're passing, the emotions that they're feeling. And I feel that art has this capability to move people to you know one you know just look through the different artists that that really inspire you I'm not just talking about you know Michelangelo and you know the Renaissance artists but also you know looking at uh Robert Del Delaunay um when I look at his art in the Pompidou Center for me it's like there's so much movement in it. I I can almost imagine in my architectural practice designing buildings like that where there is this sort of la lack of divide between the internal and external spaces where art can bridge and connect us in ways that we never knew were possible. And then yeah, I think yeah, exactly what you say. Where um, I've always found words very harsh, like in the sense that they. You know, I use them and I'm obviously a businesswoman now, so I'm very glad that when it comes to making deals happen or things happen, words exist because they're tangible and they make sure that you are precise in, in what you make happen. Um, but I've always found there's like gaps of textures and colors and things in, in how a, a situation needs to be defined or how a relationship is defined or how emotions are defined that, it, that a word simply can't capture. Um, and and, it, and and I feel that this feels it, you know, I think it's just, it's um, it's all the in-betweens, but yet that's obviously the in-betweens that just makes it really interesting. And and that applies to music as well, it applies to dance. It's just all these things that, if you were to just suddenly like summarize what you see with just a word, you would lose all of it because it's really in the subtleties of all the nuances that you've just been watching that it is interesting. Um, and and I love that, especially as, as yourself, I've traveled the world and learned different languages. You learn that words, you know, 
they they are they are just what they are they, they do the job to kind of exchange on the basics but realistically there's just so much that's lost in translation between people and cultures and 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 i do feel that music or art being more universal um is hopefully something that bridges better um because you can see when you learn languages that there are things you can't even translate um words wise there's a beauty in that universality that you know it's almost as if, you know, one of the things that when I am traveling around the world uh, back in those days, one of the things I loved to do was look outside the window in an airplane. And that was my uniform window wherever I went. That was mm -hmm. the art that I saw, the natural art that I experienced. And every time I looked through the window, I would feel, you know, the clouds and the sky. And, and the, there was, you know, I think it's Bruce Lee and forgive me, I'm a very big fan of Bruce Lee, but under the clouds and under the skies, we are all but one family. And yeah. you know, that that feeling of unity is something that I experience a lot through nature. And you know, that art can can give you, whether it's natural art or art as an experience, can give you that feeling and emotion and movement. Yeah, and perspective. I think it's the same with flying. I think it gives you perspective. Correct, correct. What's the, um, what would you say sort of really visually empowers you? Um, I mean, generally having a visually driven life, I think it's it's something I, so I'm, I'm finally uh, publishing a book next year. I said finally yeah. because I've hated doing it in every step of the way, <laughs> but I felt it was the right thing to do. Um, and the idea is very much, why does our visual diet matter? Why? how how the visuals have kind of we've looked at our entire life makes us who we are and you know and it's it's exactly this where um what empowers me is i've projected through my imagination most of the visual life i wanted to have it just sounds so silly but i have made decisions sometimes on jobs or risk of things thinking that's just simply not the story i had imagined and i've had this kind of kid-like idea that I could see what it was meant to look like, and it's just simply not what it's looking like. So I, I can't compromise halfway because that will simply be a compromise. And it's, I think visual diet is that where it's telling you that, you know, trust a bit more um, the, the the integration that you have with visuals. A great, brilliant example that I give also because we're boss women is the idea that you will talk about female empowerment daily, but then you'll be looking at girls in bikinis on your Instagram or TV shows that are all about being only purely basically an object, um, but yet talking about female empowerment and feminism, those don't kind of go hand in hand. And although you think your brain only thinks female empowerment, actually your brain is sort of digesting a, a visual language that's telling you that you should just be an object. Um, and that's because people are not really in tune with how many visuals they digest all day and what impact actually that has on them. So I think it's just being in tune of what you say and what you see and, and what you should be looking at is one thing, you know, that your brain is going to absorb and, and going to tell you who you should become as a person on the back of it. It's almost as if there's a landscape, right? And there's this sort of like digital landscape that is both the artistic visual inspiration, but there's a landscape. And I think this digital life that we have when it comes to art as well is that consumption, right? You're taking that in. That is your diet. That you're, you're visually eating it. So we, you've never been in a world where we've eaten as fast and as many visuals. Um, you know, our parents used to maybe see one advert, um, you know, every now and then we are literally digesting crazy amounts of visuals by the second we get up, whether it's through social media, whether it's through your screen, whether it's through the advert that you see on the street and on such a fast basis. Um, and those really kind of impact you. Like if, if you've been uh, kind of seeing ads or a certain type of profile or body for days, you know, you're going to wake up and think, should I lose weight or should I change this? Because I think I'm not feeling great about it. And you're not going to think where this is coming from, but this is like a back of like years and months and days of consuming hundreds of hundreds of images. Like I think, think about it, like our parents would just, yeah, just see a few images a day. Like you, that really had that impact or we're trying to also make them do things. And, and we see hundreds um, at least. 
I mean, the number of times that we open up our phone and we check our social media and we sort of like, I call it the social media loop where you basically open up one of the apps and then you go around all of them and then assume that by the time you get back to the first app that you opened, there will be messages, you know, people will have responded. So then you off you go on another loop. And so <laughs> there's this sort of like the social media loop is this sort of interactive, you know, engagement um, driving force that is all about attention seeking, right? Like your attention is being seeked and you are the center of that attention. And so- and think, Yeah, and that's one point already. I think at least you are active. If you are like knowing you, I'm the same, right? I go on the loop and I text and communicate on every loop because now there's many apps on which you communicate. But this is an action. I'm entering social conversations and I'm just basically like it's an ongoing set of conversations, right? And um, the issue with visuals is the idea that you will be completely passive, having no participation into the visuals that actually manipulate you. I think that's the issue that I've always found um, very perverse about my world is the head of marketing, the advertising kings, and uh, the top of your art world know how much visuals manipulate you. I mean, politics is the same, like hope of Shifat Ferry of, um, of Obama campaign or the NHS burst made a huge impact visually. And yet no one think, seems to care or no one thinks to say, oh, I should be caring about visuals or are our, our visuals are actually manipulating me? And and that's something that, um, that's a purpose category of it is because you have a few people at the top who know exactly that if they give you certain type of color, certain type of composition, certain type of imagery, you will be acting in a certain way. And the rest of the world doesn't have a lot of visual education at school, if not at all, and doesn't think this is that relevant. They, they think, well, you know, this is just part of the world more than a place where I can actually uh, decide, participate, and elect um, what I want to see. I've got so many questions on that. The first one is, what is visual education? As in, you know, I have a nephew and a niece and, um, you know, four years old and one and a half, and I want to be able to give them the, the, the right kind of you know, visual inspiration and education that I can. Hearing your words, I feel that, you know, when we're sort of really understanding how they see the world, it's through the eyes that we're giving them in some ways. Like we're giving them these different lenses. We're giving them these visual conversations. We're giving them these insecurities. Um, so on the one side, it's, you know, what does that mean? So, you know, if, if we were to give them a, a positive rather than a perverse mindset towards art and or visual inspiration, what will that be? Um, you know, what are the steps? How do you, yeah, what's the framework for it? So um, I started out visual education. Um, my mum is a teacher and I did uh, take her students as, as Kobe's, which I, I'm not sure I meant to do legally, but luckily the parents were very open-minded. Um, basically, the, the the current one is art history. And having done it, I don't like it because it is descriptive. I describe a lot of the painting and I get to understand the context historically of why it was created, which of course is great. I mean, having context is always key. But the visual education I see for kids is action driven. So uh, to give you a, a key example is to what I would do to the kids, which uh, again, the parents were open minded. I will, I will show them images and ask them, where do your eyes go? And they will be saying, my eyes go right or center first. And then my eyes do that little journey because obviously there's a complete journey. Like if you look, if you read through art history or if you, go through um, the head of marketing, we know exactly like where your eyes are going to go, right? So you ask the kids first, where do your eyes first go? Then you say, so what is the, the image trying to make you do? And they know, they know that if the image is on top of them and then the eyes are more is more looking up, they're meant to be intimidated. They know that if it's more central, but then it's directed to the product, they're meant to buy, they're meant to buy, to buy that product. And that is as simple as that. It's like a critical thinking but for visuals where the, most people see that as flat, a flat surface where you're meant to be passive onto. 
Um, I said as an active conversation, I can refuse to not engage with visuals. I can decide that certain visuals are not good for me. I can decide that I would refuse to do certain actions that visuals guide me to do. In the same way that when you read words and you read an opinion, um, you can decide not to agree with it, right? So you can say, that was a great opinion to read, but I don't think I want to agree with that perspective. Well, I think this is here the same. The, the big mistake currently being made is people just absorb. They just don't think they can be active with it. They don't think it's a dialogue, when in fact, it is a dialogue. If you were to slow down the impulse that you get from the response, like the reaction that you get immediately from seeing something, if you slow it down so that you are in charge of the response that you want to give, mm -hmm. If you were to open up that space and decide, like the first thing is to even be able to, to have the power to reject a visual, to mm -hmm. have the power to know that this is what what this art, this visual, this you know marketing campaign is trying to do. And ultimately, mm -hmm. art has been probably the most biggest and most profound marketing campaign of our history. Yeah. So if we yeah. are to slow down, right, like slow that down and open up that space between you know, from the moment that I see something to the moment that I react, respond, or emotion something, what would you get people to do? What were the questions or the decisions that you'd ask people, whether they're children or they're adults, what would you like them to think about? Well, I think you said it yourself, like where, you know, the power of visuals was discovered by the church. Um, they, they basically realized that the Catholic Church realized that people could not read yet. The print, the press hadn't been invented yet. And what better way for people to believe than to have visual representation that on top of this, churches were not giving you the same visuals. They were split. So depending where you sat, depending how wealthy or not you were, you were not seeing the same one. So they also completely understood marketing. Um, and I'm sorry for any religious person, uh, but it is like they were incredible. They commissioned so much art. And you talked about Michelangelo in, in, at the start, like they were major patrons of the arts, huge. So I, I'm not saying they didn't commission artists of talent. I'm saying they did it because they wanted people to believe in things. Um, and my thing is, I of course, you can believe in things. So that is not the problem. The problem is to have a choice. It's and. And so to your question, I just want people to have the choice whether or not they want to do those things. I just want them to know that they are being suggested something and they have that awareness and they have that choice. After this, if you're religious, not religious, if you want to buy the product, not buy the product, if you want to change your lifestyle or not, it's completely up to you. I have absolutely no opinion on that. You do your life about it, I do mine. But the issue comes in where you are imply you know doing things without actually understanding that you are doing them because of an overarching manipulation behind it that makes you do those things that's what bothers me is that this is where you're powerless and and i think being empowered like you said initially is about having the choice but then after that you you can use the choice um the way you want to it's almost as if we're making decisions and when we see something we make a decision to do something it's yeah. from seeing to the thinking to the acting and that relationship between whether we see something and even if it is on social media and it's an image of a of a woman in a bikini, which is like, uh, ogle, ogle, whoa. Um, and then you're like, wow, like, how does that make me feel? So the first response is, how does this make me feel? Does yeah. this make me feel good? Does this make me feel um, not so good? And then how am I going to respond with that? Is is the action after that um, an insecurity? Am I am I creating an insecurity in my mind from everything that I'm seeing, or is it making me want to do something like the power of suggestion, as you were describing before? So I'm making decisions, and it's just no, it's it's noteworthy to recognize where the choices are in those decisions. Yeah, and I think it's a curation where. Again, critical thinking in, in words is comparing sources most of the time. So you go and buy three different papers from three different political parties, and you then go and make your own opinion. That's that's the ideal of, of and I obviously you meant to do a lot more than that, but in reality, you're really going to do a few. Um, that's critical thinking words-wise. Um, when it comes to visual, it's the same idea. You should have, um, you should over time develop an awareness. This made me feel great. This pushed me in the right way. This made this inspired me in the right way. This made me feel crap. And you just 
you just can therefore create in the same way that you would say you read an article and you're like it's just I, it doesn't feel right the sources are not checked properly like um the opinion that they put forward is you know not the opinion that i i agree with i think visuals can just be exactly the same more than again um just having it in post it can just be your own creation and and that is up to you, what you feel you need and i think also there's different phases i've always had it with the artworks in the house where you know i have on the other side of david right now i have maybe i can try and show it um this oh, is wow. this is like bees that were collected from a beekeeper uh, by an artist called Ressu Mohaciel, who was generally a genius. And he then puts them in resin. Um, it's very difficult to see from here, but this is put in resin. Uh, this is called the death of hope. <laughs> so it's not very positive. Um, the one behind me, David, as we spoke to, wants to raise awareness because he wants us to move positively forward. Like he wants to make sure that things will get better. But you see, they are in conversation. And, you know, history thinks we're fucked and David thinks there's hope. Um, so this is a good example on, you don't need to just have exactly the same images. It's like people, like you will have a friend that challenges you and one that just always makes you smile, but you do need to have an awareness. If you have 10 friends who constantly make you feel crap, then that's the wrong type of friends. If you have a mix, then it's usually a bit healthier. And, and I think if I go through my house, I have this, I have ones that are, soft and ones that are challenging me and and ones that are difficult to bear because of the reality as well and and i look at it like friendship where you know you're just in a place where you need different things at different times but i'm also aware that you know if i'm next to the death of hope and it's a bad day i'm not going to be under it like it's just it's not the right day to do this if it's a day where i'm trying to get questions uh, the answers to my questions and i'm in the, in the mood to be challenged and that's the right work to kind of be next to, if that makes sense. Mm, absolutely. I think one of the the beautiful things that you spoke about just earlier was how do you create that immersion in a physical environment? Often we look at art as a that thing, you know, as we're sort of like separated from that art, but we're, you know, increasingly creating these immersive environments and especially in cities and you've done a lot of work in this in that you know you're giving people the space to interact uh, how are you doing that and how did that come about and could you tell us a little bit more about so, can we see the safest picture of the sean mars yeah absolutely. So, a little bit further down. Yeah, it's definitely not my assistant, but she's better at technological skills than i am uh, hence why you're doing it <laughs> Because otherwise we'll be there until tomorrow with me. Um, so keep uh, actually the keep going back up. So you see that here? Oh, oh, oh the Paris Airport one. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, before we talk about SAPE, so back to kind of the five years old vision. The five years old vision is any environment, even the most common ones, even the ones that you haven't paid attention. We've put art around bollards for Network Rail here, which is like the main railway um, company. We've put art in sewer drains, which are valley of lighting. And here that's in the airport. So you just go off to get your flights. But why would not that would that not be a visual experience? My idea is that everything could be an amazing visual experience. And obviously the wow factor is safety, which is a bit lower. Yeah. This is it. No, that's him, but the wow, yes, that's it. So it's difficult to kind of understand the scale because that's not a mock-up, that is an actual image of what it was, which is, um, by the way, we'll paint, so he's incredibly committed to sustainability for him, you know, if something makes an impact, it has to be sustainable. Um, and I think for us, there's always been something very important to us. We haven't actually taken part in a lot of art fairs, which the art world lost to, which basically means you ship really heavy works and ship them back just for four days for the show. And that, that's always irritated me because I feel on the sustainable basis, then you're basically kind of wasting so much um, and the crates and everything and doing that. So. Again, I think being very pronounced in, in public art from the start for us has been to say we either, either want permanent and if we do impact temporary, then it has to be sustainable because we not we don't want to be in a place where we 
you know, wasted lots of resources um, for four days well, and then that has wasted tons of resources on the back of it. So that you have 18 square meters, so 800 lengths of body wall paint of two hands uniting, um, which was on the Champ Mars in Paris, which is like basically 800 meters of land of grass. Um, you could sit from the floor, you could sit from the Eiffel Tower, you could sit from every angle. Um, it was definitely a big moment for us um, because it was also on the Financial Times cover. And being not cool, as we discussed before this call, I have literally spoken to every Eurostar person that was opening that FT saying that this was our project, which was uh, how excited I was about it. Um, and because, and, and I feel that's a classic example of, you know, I, my first boss discovered Banksy. So I love street art. I love, you know, people being able to see something in their cities. But the issue with Banksy's and a lot of this crew is that they use toxic material, was Sepe uses, you know, paint that is me, me, uh, mixed with milk, water and charcoal and basically makes no impact to the environment. It's all locally sourced and yet, you know, you have this crazy impact pictures wise and and people get involved in making it and, and it's an amazing community project as well. The recent one, and I invite you to follow him on Instagram as well, the, the recent one they just did um, 10 days ago was uniting Europe and Asia in Istanbul, which generally was insane, um, like so insane. Yeah, that he was also in 30 airports where we could travel thanks to Lavazza because the Harris of Lavazza just absolutely adores him. Um, so it was fascinating to kind of see him appearing on, on every airport as well. Um, but yeah, it's the, the Istanbul one is very meaningful because it, it is always about unity for him and the fact that it therefore united the two meant a lot. That's the first one he did at scale, which was 5,000 square meters. And um, this little girl was meant to represent, I don't know if you know, but there's um, a charity called SOS Mediterranean which basically uh, save people who are drowning in the Mediterranean when they are uh, trying to cross the border. Sadly, right now their boat is stuck in Italy and they're not allowed to help people. There's ba barely two boats helping people as we speak. And I'm sure you've seen that people are dying um, one after the other in, in shipwrecks. Um, and here the idea is, you know, the, the open hand and the welcoming hand with the little boat that's on the water. It's actually really heartbreaking. I think I love my job. I'm 12 years in, and I think we I can make an impact in my sector. But if I wasn't doing that, I will definitely be more on that topic. I just the I just cannot comprehend how we are still stuck in in that debate. Um, and it really really gets me very emotional. Um, but um, being 12 years in, I think I can help uh, my sector a lot better um, with the contacts and what I have. But later on in life this may be it because it just i i don't get how we just get those people to die in the middle of nowhere without helping them it's just something that my brain can't comprehend um i think another sustainable artist is eliza and um, she basically loved to go to the bins and collect trash and then makes artworks out of trash but obviously what's interesting is when you first look at artworks you think they are so commercial, but actually this is the opposite. Our society is very commercial because she's collected all this works and then made artworks out of it. And, you know, I mean, we've all been there. Like the amount of waste is just crazy. It's absolutely crazy. What I do love as well is depending where she is in the world, you see different types of waste. Um, so it's almost like going through an understanding of a culture through its waste. It's like if I was going through the bin but could tell who you were. Um, like going through someone's cupboard right like going through their cupboard and like sneaking through and seeing all these little items. exactly and i feel like it's so representative also of um the countries uh where she does it they're amazing we spend ages with our section committee looking for ones that we think uh, you can click on the video if you want we can have a little video break you've listened to me quite a bit so it's always good to have breaks Maybe not. I'm. Uh, I'm actually just going to share the screen directly to the Chrome tab. Just give me one sec. Right. <laughs>
It's just to give you an idea on, on how she assembles them. But, um, and she is someone who is fascinating to listen to on the economics of waste, and she's very passionate about it. Um, and I mean, I think that would definitely be a big challenge of our generation over the coming 20, 30 years. It's just mountains and mountains of waste. Um, so, yeah. I That's think it's one of those things that, that we almost, um, it's funny that we've got a, um, a coffin here, but it's almost as if we are embellished in our waste and our waste is sort of the the pride and joy and the badge of honour of our times. Yeah, and sadly, um, it seems that the more we grow economically, the more we waste, uh, which is a huge shame as well. And that's this lovely lady. So it gives you an idea, I think, with this slide on, you know, how much like who they are and and why we only support very committed, passionate artists and and who we want to give a voice to. I think a conversation that we had together was the fact that um, it's, I opened my my own gallery in Los Angeles and so the influence that people who were famous had on the world. I think Hollywood is is a big shaper of brains and desires and. And I just felt, how can I be in a place where I give a voice to people, I get them to be known and famous and successful, but therefore they they use it because they have a content that I want to be uh, seeing reaching to kids. You know, there's a video uh, out on the internet, you can Google it, where Jeff Koons and Fyle Williams in 2012 are having a conversation because he's being interviewed. and the water that they are drinking has been served by a naked woman with huge boobs, completely naked. And they having that conversation, smiling at each other as if nothing happened. And I just don't want to be the person that made Jeff Koons famous. Like, I'm just like, I can't be that woman. Like, I want, I want to make someone really known that yeah, that's more for your time, but I, I because I remember watching this video because I wanted to understand a bit more the brain of the two, and then just seeing this woman appearing, meet video completely naked, and I was just like, what is this? Like, this is crazy. Um, and and I just feel like this is a thing. It's just I want my artists to be role models as much as they're very talented, and I want to show that talent and being a role models can be hand in hand. And I, you know, I don't want to be thinking in my head. I have made someone who's now going to be super successful and the values he's bringing onto the world are actually very toxic or negative um, or having naked women around serving him water. Um, so the it's I think it was really a shock after LA to therefore make that decision that if the values were not right, we would not want to wish success on that person and enable that success as well. Yeah, you will be shocked. <laughs> I think I think I think what shocks me the most is that we are trying to create this normal, whatever we think normal is. We're trying to, you know, visualize it and share it and almost like shockingly suggest. And it's like these activities that suggest certain behaviors that we think are normal, but they're actually not normal. Um, or are they like, you know, you create the normality that you want to see, like, you know, five years ago, the idea that we would have spent pretty much the entire year at home would never have existed. Yeah. And, and also I feel like, you know, taking the example of the naked woman with Jeff Koons, people may have watched it not finding it not normal. Like I think we are in all bubbles, as you said, of normalities. I watch it and I'm shocked. Um, I, but I think somebody else might watch it and think, well, it's just, you know, a beautiful woman serving water naked. That's what happens in a business meeting. Um, obviously not in mine, um, but it's just maybe in somebody else. So it's always being careful about what is our world of visuals. And I think also when we feel trapped by the social media thinking, I'm only seeing that kind of content, that is the the way to divert and, and try and follow people who challenge the same content over and over again. You know, I think when everyone was saying, I only see Joe Biden and Kamala Harris on my Instagram, you know, if 70 million have voted for the opposite, then I think you should venture out in a different network visually 
and see what's actually being said. Um, and visuals are exactly the same. Like they can't just be the same people posting the same visual all day. So if you find yourself in that position, then just venture out. So just go for somebody that posted a very different type of content. Because also people can feel trapped and think that is the only reality of the world, where in reality they are, as you know, hundreds um, that can occur visually. I think what I've been trying to decipher in art is just recognizing where there is the opportunity to interact and like to sort of break down this sort of relationship that we have, that we take ownership over. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to share actually some of the images that you sent over to me, um, which have really sort of inspired me to, to recognize what, you know, what that relationship with London can be. Um, so I'm going to share that if I if it does work, if it doesn't, fair enough. But, um, you know, for me, the, the shocking truth of London and how we interact with London is, you know, something that goes beyond what we what we know and what we can probably never really understand. Um, unfortunately, it's not working. But, um, you know, one, one of the yeah, one of the challenges is walking into the streets of London and recognizing that this is your relationship with the land that you're on. These are your local descriptions. These are your, you know, your your um, uh, almost like the pillars of what you believe in becomes the visual sort of mapping. Like, you know, to give you another example, when arriving into um, something like Burning Man, right, like you arrive and it's like the empty plier. And then over the course of the week, the month, depending on how early you get there to build out your camp, something is then being built up onto this canvas, the playa canvas. So what can that canvas show you? Yeah, I mean, so as you know, um, we are super fortunate because right now you have eight public art projects in central London um, that is driven by us. And Going back to my fairy little sting um, from my childhood, um, I was walking down the streets during the first lockdown, back and forth. I find cities fascinating like you. And um, and I was just like, it will be a very different experience. The pace of the way we're going to look at things, the city is going to change. And also we need to make sure that something is inspiring and hopeful and positive to look at because it, we need to cope with that change as well, visually and mentally. So luckily, um, Westminster, Corn Estate, Capco, Victoria Bid, all those people believed in us and said that was the right thing to do, which um, is definitely very lucky on that front. And we've been able and, you know, invite people to go on our site. There's a whole map if you want to kind of go on a walk, especially for the one more London base, because there's not much to do right now. Also, you will find me walking there three times a day because all my meetings are basically brainstorming from one public art to another. And I wanted to kind of give back the idea that the city could be visual. And again, I think it's time to also show that this is something that's a positive response and that people will want it to stay. I've, you know, yeah, that's it. Um, that was nice actually it because- It took a while to get there. I was trying to figure out how to, because a keynote okay. wasn't working, um, but realized yeah, if I could- yeah, 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 yeah. doing it, it will take us a week. So you are high achieving on my standard. Um, so that's 12 meters of a uh, public art outdoor exhibition by artist Delphine Diallo, which is right now on Regent Street. Uh, that is me captured while speaking to the policemen. I felt so proud of this. I, One of my highest joy in life is to hide from my public art projects on the corner and see how you can interact with it because um, it's really what it's meant for. It's, it's meant for people kind of interacting and looking at it and responding to it um, and and you so proud that they ask questions and and you know this is their streets they've been on their streets like um daily and i i'm just so proud that they um they validated it you know that's that's exactly who i want to speak to um definitely is super inclusive so you know it's really about female empowerment that is me looking so happy um i'm sorry it's very self-centered but i was generally the happiest woman ever created on planet earth when that was launched um and this is face to face which was um supported by the global uh, uh fund for the human rights um we didn't run this project but our artist matter hussein contributed to it um what's really beautiful is 
I mean, very sadly, when he w went to school, um, he kept on being told that he should go back home to where he come from um, because his school was quite racist. And, and I think that's really sad because it kind of grew up that way. So he named the Sari going back home because he actually went back home to where his mom is from in Kashmir in Pakistan. And um, so in Kings Cross right now, if you walk just outside the station and go under the tunnel, you um you will have an exposure into this beautiful people from Kashmir and landscape from Kashmir which also is amazing because you can travel um to this region and I think also as you know yourself like that region is normally so newsworthy and dramatic on the news and and instead this is a very kind of beautiful aesthetic um nature landscape people that I think is just really touching um that you can see so that's right outside um Kids Cross and also the tunnel that goes off to St. Pancras as well. This is David who is behind me. Um, this is a little outdoor exhibition. We called it a cabinet of curiosities. And we basically gave you tons of little objects um, that we felt were really kind of aesthetically pleasing and telling. And we kind of got the trees to grow through the cabinets. Um, obviously that's not real, that's cut. Um, and the trees were already being cut, just so you ask. But um, but it's just it's almost like if nature was re kind of taking over the city, which I really like. That's quite big. Um, so that's a tiny picture, but this will be a much larger cabinet coasties. This is in St. James's. That's Leo Kayar on the left of which are uh, his Renaissance women. He thinks that. Well, first of all, I'm super proud that two of my male photographer artists describe themselves as feminist artists because I think um, if you want to battle for causes, you should all have each other's side, not just women feminists and men non-feminists. Um, and that's, uh, he photographs women who he called the Renaissance women, so the idea that they will be almost a polymath of their time, which I think is also very elegant. And you can see the reflection of Conduit Street on it. Um, I mean, I'm doing this almost every day and it's still magical every day because, you know, it's just, it's such a different relationship to the city to just have art up. Um, and it's a complete dream uh, to be in that position. So, and I'm sure my son has had enough. He's got done that walk so many times now. He's just like, I cannot cope anymore with seeing art up on the streets, but I do get excited every two seconds I do it. <laughs> I think there was this really beautiful thing um, that you once shared with me, and that is slow art. We have slow food, we have slow living, we have slow yoga. Um, tell us what is slow art? Um, I feel this is David for me. David is, the, you know, it's a bit like in love, and that's me being French, where you have the crush, always been a disaster on that, um, and you obsessively obsessive about this person, and then it usually it happened that it's not successful and quite dramatic at the end. And then you have the relationship that's generally lovely and builds up and gets more loving over time. And I think slow art is that, like David is this, like it's sadly not great, uh, the video for the painting, but every day you see a new detail. It's like he's painted on wood and then on top you will have the cement of the planet, the gold leaf, the resin, and then he will have burnt it. and all the details come out every single day. And and he has, a, and our friendship with David and our professional relationship is exactly the same. It just grows stronger every day and in a very slow, loving way as well. And I think his art is actually just that too. And it's the nicest for the soul because it's a really confident love. It's a very quiet, confident one. And it's also a contemplation that's very pleasurable, that's also not aggressive and and just, moves around with you and it's yeah that's my definition of it um he's the perfect representation of it and i think that's why many people have wanted his works because i mean especially in COVID times i mean david is just david has had a successful year again he doesn't see what a crisis is and his art is just still it just keeps growing and it makes you happy it's just no drama and i think no drama for 2020 is definitely what everyone needs so i think it's it's why all of us have had him behind us taking his energy with us so that we could stay in that cocoon as well that's beautiful and i think that's resilience that's yeah. resilience 
been art artists and those that are being pushed to the you know the outer quarters of the city because it's too expensive to live indoors in inside the inner city so there's you know there's a sort of coming back of the city to sort of like take up their spaces so that they can be represented across the city of those of the people that live there that are also in conversation with their art and to be able to like you sit on the side but just you know be immersed in the the experience that people are having with that art and contemplate you know uh, contemplating it yeah and as you said um, my hope for what's happening is that as more spaces become available creatives will be able to come back into the center which was more the case in the 80s um and obviously new york has gone through this as well like basquiat was right in the heart of new york um and and i, I hope that it will shrink a bit but also means creatives comes back in and and we that this time know how to keep them in not push them out again um it's that's something that i feel we haven't done well in the past boom is that we have pushed them too far out rather than making you know having structures that keep them in totally totally i think one of the the pieces of art that i really enjoyed was the earthscapes um you know the the kind of the question and of of how do we how do we choose to spend our time um in in a limited existence so we often a um maybe don't experience the entirety of our lifespans as like a the 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 bigger picture of our lives um and to be able to toggle between the sort of the minutia detail the um the experience of a minute a second to that sort of this is my life as a broad span um tell us a little bit about the earthscapes and how that you know really did um sort of bring out that um experience of a limited exp uh, existence so by earthscape so sorry me being honest um what do you mean the earthscape of david or what do you call the earthscapes oh of amador um oh, it was completely unrelated sorry um you know i don't actually um i think it's i think for me it's just it hopefully gives um a perspective for people to kind of see the impact you know i think it's so difficult to have a macro view i think our life has been in silo as well so i would hope that you know, this is um, hopefully a, a well-needed perspective um, and something that can, the more you think macro, the better, I think, because the more you understand your own impact as well. There was also a, a really beautiful piece of art by Olafur, um, the, um, the I, I think the ICE project or ICE watch where, you know, it's almost okay. as if there are, you know, the pieces of ice that have basically started melting and to give people that, the experience of time and climate, you know, action that is required because time is running out. Yeah, well, I mean, Olafur has been one of the first ones that was super committed to it. Um, I mean, the show last year at Tate was literally incredible. Um, I don't know if I'm a fan of this, though. I, I uh, of the ice outside Tate, um, to throw a bit of controversy, I think, um, I love his shows. I love the fact that he's bringing science and art together and educating on on bus fronts. I love the artist, and you know, if he was younger, that is definitely one of the artists we'll have loved to work with because obviously I'm aware that he's a whole different scale now. Um, I think the difficulty that I have with the ice cubes is this is for me for a very. It feels like it's again a lot of resources to do it. Um, to make a statement to people who already convince. That's the best possible way I can portray it. But I'm not sure I'm in on on the execution of that. Mm. It's sort of like, um, do you know about it? Um, in, you know, Replenish Earth, we have 12 steps to becoming a replenisher. So from the point of, I am completely unaware, don't care about anything. What are you talking about? I have responsibility. No, I don't. To, you know what? I'm all in. Let's go. Um, but there are steps to coach somebody to get to that place. There are steps that we in Replenish Earth have, have taken um, those steps to be aware of something, to be exposed to something and take something personally. And I uh, think that's the problem with the ice cube where basically it's talking to the convinced and is spending a lot of resources talking to the convinced, but someone that's not um, 
convinced is not going to look at this. They're going to think contemporary art is crap. Like here they go again, spending lots of money and resources for something that is meaningful, not meaningful. That's exactly what someone who is not convinced and who is not in contemporary art would actually think looking at this. And that's what I guess I'm careful with because you know, contemporary art has a bad rep. Like uh, a lot of people have done things where the banana of Emmanuel Perrotin last year with Mauricio Catalan made a lot of people talking that people could buy a banana for a hundred thousand dollars that was written. Um, and people like this and it adds to the gossip. It's a bit like celebrities gossip, it adds to it, but it does sadly attacks the image and reputation of the rest of people who try and do the right thing. And I think for the ice cube, I could see someone that's not in contemporary art, that's not convinced about sustainability to look at this thinking, what a waste of stuff. Um, which that's what I mean by maybe the Tate is a wrong place. Maybe it's about going out to a place they're not convinced and, and having a whole education. But anyone who goes to Tate is likely to be convinced. And that's what bothers me about it because you are, you are, you're shocking for the Instagram of people who already convinced and you're wasting lots of resources in doing that. And I'm not sure I validate this approach. Mm. There's a really big question, I think, in what I'm taking away from our conversation today, which is on visual diet and inspiration. But what is it that, that becomes the education piece that we have in terms of the physical immersive experiences that we create? Um, that I'm going to completely you know, geek out on later, just, you know, the idea of con um, contemplating, the rate of contemplation, the slowing down, the sort of like the speeding in and out of the seasonality of life during the day. Um, and, it, and it feels very much like art ecotherapy. It's true. And I think it's, if our ways of walking around the city was slower, it would also be better, I think, for our own health and our own appreciation. Yeah, totally. Well, um, you know, thank you so much for joining us on Replenish Earth Live. And it just gives us an opportunity to talk about a subject that is very dear to the city and the experience that a citizen may have. It's so dear to the relationship that we create, not only with incredible themes like how to uh, tackle policy on immigration for refugees or a variety of you know uh, current and important topics that can be brought to the fore you know for for us we only concentrated mostly on climate action um, but art has an incredible means through which we can educate and I think um, you know through your work and through the questions that you're asking and hopefully the book that you're uh, going to be sharing with us as well, it gives us an opportunity to really step into those um, eyes and to look through that lens. Well, thank you so much for having me. And if um, you are keen to learn more, don't hesitate to contact me, don't hesitate to ask questions. There's a lot of resources we can send people to also dive in even deeper, especially when it's a new subject as well. Totally. Thank you so much, Maureen. Um, and hope to have you again soon. It's a good one. Thank you. Thank you. So that has our fourth day started. Uh, Replenishing Earth starts with the smallest of actions. And you become a replenisher by participating in today's Rise to Replenish Challenge. Today's theme is Second Life. And we've introduced this activity with the chance to learn how to make homemade paper. Today, I pledge to innovate and give a second life to my waste by reusing it, repurposing it, recycling it, Please join us and engage with our social media handles. Um, you will find all of the different activities throughout the entirety of L uh, London Climate Action Week. You can win prizes if you get involved. You can get a free ticket to our workshop. Uh, we can get um, you can get a ticket to our VIP eco party. You know you want to come. Um, you can get a free copy of the Replenish book, which is also available to buy on Amazon and or one on one uh, coaching sessions uh, get featured on our social media. And it really does give us an opportunity to take the, 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 the conversation about climate action way beyond just, you know, talking about it to acting on it. So without further ado, thank you so much for your time. Um, please get engaged with the comments, um, find out more about Marine's art. Um, the art agency, the work that the artists are doing, get involved with um, exploring your city and the kind of visual inspiration and the diet that you are consuming through the actual city. Thank you very much for your time and see you shortly.